All right, if you've made it this far to lecture four of four, congratulations. Uh, I appreciate you sticking with me as we move through uh, both a really whirlwind uh, summary of political um, history of Western Europe, then we moved into the American Revolution, we contrasted it with the French Revolution, and now we move into uh, the Haitian Revolution and the Latin American Revolutions and the movement of abolition that really kind of bring out the bookend, the opposite end uh, of the Age of Revolutions that bring us uh, to our conclusion. And um, we noted last lecture, in lecture number three, that the French Revolution was far more radical than the American Revolution was. Um, that is, even though the American Revolution achieved its goal of independence, it was far from a social revolution, right? Uh, the American Revolution didn't really change the status of colonials except from making them no longer British and, and cementing them as American. But even, even though they were American, the, the new system that they operated in was still largely a British system, right? There weren't really kind of any specific major overturns uh, in the new American society. The French Revolution, of course, to contrast, is totally different. Um, what begins as an anti-monarchical uh, revolution kind of slowly snowballs into this radical uh, Republican movement that has a reign of terror, and hopefully you listen to the whole BBC podcast about what the reign of terror was. Your weekly response asks you to talk a little bit about the reign of terror and um, why perhaps it didn't happen in the American Revolution uh, and what it means for kind of understanding the French Revolution. So it had this radical reign of terror, and then it, it becomes a, an, an empire, right? The French Revolution that began as anti-monarchical becomes a empire under an emperor who was a, who was a dictator, and goes on to conquer large portions of France before he's uh, large portions of Europe, before he's defeated in 1815, and then everything kind of goes back to the way it was. It's 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 really kind of mind boggling, you know, to understand the French Revolution and Napoleonic Europe, and then in 1815 with the Congress of Vienna, which we'll talk about a little bit later, it just kind of says, okay, let's pretend that didn't happen, right? Okay, France is a monarchy again. All these other monarchies are reestablished. That revolutionary stuff is over. Uh, we're not going to do it again. And that system that was established in 1815 uh, lasts all the way until 1914, so about a century uh, and the beginning of the First World War that slowly undoes um, the portions uh, of Napoleonic Europe and uh, the uh, portions of, of, of the Congress of Vienna. So we, we transition then to an even more radical revolution when we talk about the Haitian Revolution, which took place between 1791 and 1804. We save this one for last because, again, chronologically, it is the last of the revolutions we're going to look at, but also because it borrows elements from both the American Revolution and the French Revolution. That is, it's an anti-colonial revolution. Uh, Haiti or Saint-Domingue was a French colony. Um, so the part of the Haitian Revolution is an anti-colonial movement against France. But it's also a social revolution. At its core, the Haitian Revolution began as a slave revolution. And so importantly, uh, this brings back ties to week number two, where we talked about um, slavery, transatlantic slavery, and the social construction of race. And then we talk about how this slave insurrection uh, created dramatic changes throughout the Atlantic world, so if we're looking at kind of the later part of the uh, Age of Revolutions, this, this Haitian Revolution probably had the biggest impact uh, on the early 19th century, far more than the American or the, um, ha uh, than the French Revolution, especially in the Americas. So we'll look at this as kind of our most radical revolution because it combines elements of the American Revolution and the French Revolution. And so we're talking about Saint-Domingue, or Haiti, as it became known after the Revolution, which is this island in the Caribbean, a French colony, and at the time, in the late 18th century, just before the turn of the 19th century, it was probably the wealthiest uh, of all of the colonies of the New World because it produced so much sugar, uh, which at the time was an incredibly valuable uh, commodity uh, that made it probably the most wealthy colony. Uh, definitely in New France, uh, it was definitely wealthier than any colony uh, of the English. Perhaps the only area of the New World that would have rivaled Saint-Domingue is Potosi uh, because of its production of silver for the Spanish Empire. So what happens in Haiti? Well, the Haitian Revolution, which began in 1791, uh, can directly connect itself back to the French Revolution. Remember that the French Revolution began because the French king tried to raise taxes on the third estate and impose taxes on the first two estates. And the reason the French king did this was because the French had run up a tremendous amount of debt, 
supporting the Americans in their revolution. Well, in the same way, the Haitian Revolution is directly connected uh, to the French Revolution. As I mentioned before, Saint-Domingue, uh, which is this uh, western part of the island of Hispaniola, you can see down there uh, on the map, the western side uh, of this island. The eastern side uh, is now the Dominican Republic uh, and a Spanish colony. But what had happened in this French colony is that rumor had spread of the revolution that had swept through France. And what had been uh, discussed was that the National Assembly, as part of its reforming processes, had banned slavery uh, in France, which actually didn't mean much, right? There weren't many, if any at all, uh, slaves, especially African slaves, in France itself, in the mainland Europe. Uh, however, there were French slaves scattered throughout its colonies. And so rumor had spread uh, that the National Assembly, in the name of liberty, equality, and fraternity, uh, had created uh, an end to slavery, had, had abolished slavery. And this rumor gained incredible traction among the majority of people in Haiti or in Saint-Domingue who were enslaved. Uh, unlike in British North America, especially in the Caribbean and in Brazil, the number of enslaved people greatly outnumbered uh, the number of free people. Uh, the same thing would occur on, on British islands later and partially leads to the reason why Britain will outlaw slavery as well. But in Saint-Domingue, there were a couple rich planters, right? These were French men, uh, some of whom had been born in Saint-Domingue, but a lot of whom had come over uh, from France to govern uh, the plantations. These white French men were a vast minority in Saint-Domingue, and most of the people were either enslaved uh, people of African descent, maybe they were newly arrivals or they were second or third generation slaves, um, but the vast number of people were either enslaved people of African descent or some free mixed race people, people who had either French and African blood or French and nat or native and African blood, uh, were the majority of people. When you took those two groups, the uh, enslaved and then the free people of color in Saint-Domingue, this was the vast majority. I'm talking upwards of 90% uh, of people in Saint-Domingue could trace their connection directly to slavery uh, and directly to racial difference. And so what happened was, once this, revel uh, once this rumor took hold among these people, a slave rebellion began uh, in Haiti. And there had been slave rebellions in other places uh, of the New World uh, throughout the 18th and even in the 17th century. Slave populations had risen up against uh, slave masters, but the difference is that all of them had been defeated. Uh, here in South Carolina, there was a very big uh, slave rebellion in the English colony called the Stono Rebellion. Uh, and the Stono Rebellion, which is in uh, the earlier 18th century, um, was a large uprising of enslaved people on plantations uh, a little bit further south from Columbia, closer to Charleston. Uh, and people, they were marching towards Florida because they believed if they escaped to Florida, they would be granted freedom uh, in the Spanish colony. But the people were eventually caught uh, and most of the leaders and were executed in harsh laws uh, against slave uprisings were enacted in South Carolina. What differentiates the um, Haitian Revolution is that the slaves are successful. And why is this? Well, because partially there was no reinforcement coming from Spain, uh, from France. France was embroiled uh, in the French Revolution during this period uh, where there's a, the revolution in Haiti, the slave uprising. And so there wasn't a military dispatch coming from France. There were problems uh, in the metropole back in, back in France that meant that they couldn't divert men, resources, and money uh, to quashing this slave rebellion uh, in Haiti. And one of the leaders of this slave rebellion is a man by Toussaint Louverture, right? Uh, All Saints, the opening, right, in, in French. Uh, and All Saints, Toussaint, he created uh, a, a movement of uh, both slaves and people of color uh, to overthrow uh, the French colonizers. And they're ultimately successful. And Haiti declares itself an independent republic after the French removed their last troops in 1803. And this moment is a really important moment in kind of the history of the world. There's been a lot of talk, especially with um, the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States recently, about, about abolition. And, you know, a lot of people have said, well, Britain's the first nation to abolish slavery. And that's entirely incorrect. Uh, 
uh, Haiti was, 1803, this new Haitian Republic, and I talk a little bit at the end, they create their own Declaration of Independence that does something totally radical. The American Declaration of Independence actually kind of cements slavery, but the Haitian Declaration of Independence abolishes slavery uh, entirely uh, in Haiti. And so they do this radical revolution in, led by slaves in which slavery is outlawed. And, you know, I would really have you normally in class, I have, if we're meeting in person, I have different groups read uh, different declarations, but you can go out and Google all of these. For your primary source discussion, you're reading the Declaration of the Rights of Man that comes from the French Revolution. But compare the Declaration of Independence from the United States with the Declaration of Independence from France and the Haitian Declaration of Independence, uh, obviously from Haiti. Compare these three very similar but in incredibly different documents to understand how revolution was different in all uh, three of these places. If you're interested in an outside project or this kind of thing interests you, you'll really notice some striking differences uh, between all three uh, of these declarations. And the Haitian Revolution, I've kind of skipped through it a little bit quickly, it ultimately has kind of mixed outcomes. Unfortunately, after the abolition of slavery, the production of sugar in Haiti entirely collapses. And uh, the United States was aided, as I said, by France in their revolution. No nation is coming to the aid of slaves revolting against the colonizer, right? In fact, this was like the biggest fear for any of the colonial powers or the United States. You know, slave insurrections were terrifying to slave masters. So no nation is going to come to Haiti's aid, meaning that after sugar production plummets, the Haitians have to kind of work out a new system that looks a lot like slavery. And then Toussaint Louverture is actually captured and he's brought back to Europe where he dies in a prison right on the French border of Switzerland. And uh, Haiti goes through dramatic uh, economic transformations that really continue straight through the Haitian earthquake of the earlier 2000s. Uh, it remains a largely impoverished nation, um, not because uh, its revolution was a failure, but rather because the other nations of uh, the New World and of the Old World are not going to come to the aid uh, of the um, slaves revolting against their masters. And it's kind of a long legacy of slavery and racial difference that we talked about uh, in week two. But what are some of the other outcomes of this? Well, the loss of Haiti causes Napoleon to give up his kind of plans for an empire in the New World. He sells Louisiana, this large, not just the state, this huge chunk of land, one third of the United States. Uh, he sells to Thomas Jefferson in 1803. So this is, you know, the f uh, fall of Haiti uh, for the French Empire is actually a big boon to the United States, helps this country grow. Uh, but it also means that uh, across the Atlantic world, the United States and Cuba and Brazil, uh, strict slave codes are enacted to try to prevent a slave insurrection from happening like the one that happens uh, in, in Haiti. In the United States in particular, in South Carolina, probably one of the only states that ever had a, a, a black population or an enslaved population larger than a white population, really strict codes are put in after Haiti to prevent anything like that from happening in the United States. And this is ultimately what leads to slavery existing in the United States for longer than someone like Thomas Jefferson would have thought, who thought it was on its way out. Uh, it's not. It actually gets further cemented into the United States. Um, also, the British, worried about slave insurrection, will begin, uh, led by William Wilberforce, to abolish slavery in their colonies. Just like the French, the British colonies of the Caribbean had larger um, enslaved populations than free. And in order to prevent losing their colonies entirely, the British will begin a process of abolition. That's not immediate, but it's gradual. So the British will be the first kind of major nation after Haiti uh, to abolish slavery. But even more important, the weakened presence of the French in the Caribbean meant that the Spanish were also um, weakened because uh, Spain had been invaded by Napoleon. So Spain couldn't send their armies to reinforce their empires in the New World either. And this gives rise to a revolutionary mind in Latin America by the name of Simon Bolivar. Uh, Simon Bolivar is going to begin to try to start a revolution in Venezuela. It's ultimately unsuccessful, and so he has to escape. And where does he go? Well, he goes to Haiti, of course, uh, a place that had practiced an anti-colonial uh, revolution. And from Haiti, he leads a... Um, a uh, uh, an invasion of Venezuela, and he'll ultimately become kind of the George Washington of Latin America. He'll spawn a group of revolutions against Spain uh, from Latin America that will create an entirely new uh, South and Central American political landscape. As you can see here, you'll see all these nations of South America and Latin America that gain their independence uh, under uh, Simon Bolivar and then his successors uh, afterwards that kind of demolishes the Spanish Empire in the New World. And so summing it all up, right, why does it all matter? 
I hope you got out of today's lecture that, you know, the age of revolution was a period of interconnected revolution. They all touch each other somehow. But even though they're all revolutionary, some were more revolutionary than others. And this is what I want you to kind of talk about in your weekly response. Make sure to check that out. We'll be talking about the reign of terror. See you next.